All right. Hello and welcome to the Expert Inside Interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you from lovely San Diego as per usual. And today I'm joined by Eddie Turner, who is in lovely Houston, Texas. How are you doing, Eddie? I'm well, John, and yourself? Oh, fantastic. And Eddie, Eddie is the author of 140 Simple Messages to Guide emerging leaders. It's an Amazon best-selling book. And that's what we wanted to talk about today is how, uh, is how to develop and help uh, emerging leaders. So first of all, Eddie, what was the genesis of the book and, and how did you come up with 140 simple messages? The genesis of the book and how I came up with 140 simple messages are intertwined, if you will. <laughs> Essentially, I uh, was writing for Forbes. And Forbes has a character limitation on what they would allow us to submit, especially for the Q and A's, the question and answer column. And I did probably about 30 of those. Right. And so we were capped at hundred and we were capped at 400 characters. And I started to see the numbers on the people that were reading those articles. Some of those articles have been read 30 or 40,000 times. Wow. And so what that proved to me, there is a market for short, succinct, messaging, mm -hmm. especially around a topic of leadership. And so I recognize that that was a kind of a data point. But then also, as I look at how many books I have on my shelf from friends of mine, or some of the folks who were kind enough to send me a copy of their book for whatever reason, we don't necessarily always get through an entire book. But yeah. we will all read a tweet. So mm -hmm. I decided that at the time, I started that book, Twitter's limitation was 140 characters. Right. By the time I ended the book, uh, they had changed it to 280. So my messages are actually as, as large as 280, some of them shorter. Uh, but the idea was short, succinct messages that are tweetable, shareable, and more importantly, impactful. Yeah, I, I think that's great because I, I mean, for good or for better or for worse, we live in a world today where people are very distracted, they have short attention spans, and therefore giving them information in consumable formats is always a, is always a good thing, you know, particularly when, as you say, it's impactful. Mm -hmm. um, so let's talk about uh, the, the first section of your book, you talk about leadership beginning in youth, right? Tell yes. me a little bit about that. For many years, I thought a person had to be born as a leader. Mm -hmm. And if you weren't born as a leader, you didn't have that certain gene, well, you, it's just kind of going to be, be tough. You can't necessarily be a leader after that. But I, I learned later on that that's not the case. One thing, however, that I do believe very firmly is a lot of the traits we have as leaders later in life really are seated in us in our youth. And so I talk about the work that my parents did with me and lessons mm -hmm. that no doubt all of us may have uh, uh, rebelled a bit against some advice our parents may have given us and some of their discipline and, and instructions. But later on in life, uh, people will say, you sound just like your dad. You sound just like your mom, right? Because now I am living by those things more fully than I ever did. But the discipline, the structure, those things I got as a youngster, uh, those things have carried over into my adulthood. But also, more importantly, that I like to share with people uh, when working with leaders is to never minimize the impact they can have on a young person. Oh, yeah. yeah. Because outside of my parents and my family members, there are many adults who readily come to mind when I think about the impact that someone in the community, one of my teachers, one of the coaches, someone in a religious context, someone had an impact on me and it still shapes who I am years later. And so that's the message I wanted people to take away from that section of the book. Not that you can't be a leader if you weren't born with certain genes, but that our leadership qualities are starting to be shaped in the formative age. Yeah, I, I think that's a that's a very powerful point. And and the point is, let's face it, the people who influence us um, the most, you know, whether it's our parents or any of those other people, it's yes, it's what they say, but it's more importantly what they do, right? So we we as children, like kids, observe what you do as opposed to what you say. And I think sometimes when we're adults, you know, that's probably something we forget that how powerful an impact our our actions and whether our words and our actions match. 
Indeed, uh, children are great imitators. Mm -hmm. They, uh, in fact, um, one of the speeches I used to give, I would talk about the fact that a child learns how to read, a child learns how to eat and do anything that they do, not because they sat in a class. Yeah. They watched their parents. They watched their older brother and sister, and that's how they started to form sentences and started to do certain things, right? So leadership is both based on that action, it's based on what people are doing intentionally, but also those unintentional things or what people don't do as a leader impacts a young person. Sometimes mm -hmm. a parent may say, well, where'd you learn that word at? Or where'd yeah. you get that attitude from? Right, well, mom, dad, they learned it from you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know exactly. I, I I I had that experience myself not too long ago, where I said something like to to my I have a fourteen year old son or whatever, and I I was getting frustrated, and I said, "Oh, you're so stubborn," and he looked, <laughs> he just looked at me and he went, "Yeah, really? Where do you think I get that from?" And and I was just like one of those moments where you're just looking in a mirror and you're going, "Oh, for God's sake! Yeah, I get it. I get it." <laughs> <laughs> Um, so then you, you talk about another section, you talk about the leadership development of self. And this is something that I just wanted to focus in on because, you know, leaders and people's concept of leadership is always tends to be focused on developing other people and leading and your example and all of that, but not so much on development of self. Yes. At times we, we always look out, we look at other people, we look at other areas, but fundamentally if I am not working on Eddie, mm -hmm. I cannot lead anyone else. Right. I must learn how to master my own organism. And all of us can attest to how difficult that is. Uh, in fact, every time I get on the scale, I understand how poorly I am leading Eddie <laughs> in certain areas of my life. Uh, but when it comes to my mental being, right? Uh, mentally, morally, spiritually, whatever it may be, how am I conducting myself as a person? Because ultimately, when I then go to open my mouth in front of an audience, as we just talked about with children, people are not listening to what I am saying in as much as they are listening to the actions that I am uh, demonstrating. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the, the, the older people when I was growing up would say, don't preach me a sermon, show me one. Yeah, yeah, don't, good, 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 wise words. Uh, but the thing is, and as I said, this is a this is a particularly, I think, difficult area for a lot of people because as we as we were saying, I, you know, we live in a we live in a strange world today. I mean, I think we'll all admit it. So it's so fast paced, it's so distracting. We have been we're bombarded with uh, technology and we're bombarded with messages coming to us through our phones, through everywhere. And taking a step back to do self-reflection is that is tough nowadays, right? But more almost more critical than ever. Self-reflection is one of the gifts that I offer clients as an executive coach and as their leadership coach. Mm -hmm. When I sit with the client, and I am giving them what I call a sacred space where they yeah. un, 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 unfold, lay out to me, whatever it may be on their mind. In many cases, for some of those clients, it is the only time they ever sit silently with their thoughts. Mm. Now, that's scary, right? Because you're thinking, well, surely they do it on their own when they're by themselves. But re the reality is every moment of our day is invaded. Yes. And it is invaded by these mobile devices that we are tethered to, right? And mm -hmm. so even when people are alone, they're never really alone. They're multitasking. They're doing something on a device. And it's only when they sit in that coaching session with me that we've both put those devices outside the room or what have we done, but they're not in the room with us interrupting. Mm -hmm. Now for the first time, they are talking and then I'm reflecting back to them what they're saying and they're hearing those words and it hits them like a ton of bricks. Sometimes it's not that I've said something brilliant. All I've done is repeat back their own words to the client. And that reflective period leads to an aha moment, leads to a light bulb, leads to a realization. So yes, reflection is a true gift that a client gets with working with a coach. But also I encourage clients, be it... Uh, whatever your practice is, yoga, meditation, uh, a morning walk, um, to really engage in moments of silent reflection 
even if it's just 15 minutes in the morning, 15 minutes at night, do something to where you are just with your thoughts and thinking about who you are, what you've done, and what do you like to be? Yeah, and I think that's fantastic advice. And unfortunate, unfortunately, it's not something that comes natural to a lot of people. It's not something, as you said, that even gets taught. And I, I'm 100%. I, I think that coaches are incredibly important. And I think it's, it, it, it's sad and, and strange sometimes if you think about it is we spend more, we, we will happily spend money on a coach for our hobbies. But we won't spend money on a coach for, for the thing that puts bread on our table, right? <laughs> I'm glad you said that because that is true. Yes, I don't know very many people in my community that aren't paying a ton of money for their kids' coaches for Little League and ballet and dance and piano. They're doing it for all of those things, and they are doing it themselves in many cases, to your point. But when it comes to sorting out their life, sorting out their business, now, not only do they not want a coach, but the few that want to pay for a coach question the fee. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, absolutely. I agree with you. And I did. I mean, I'll tell you, I personally, when I got my first ever executive level job, like VP level job, and I was on the senior management team, I had that moment where I went, wow. How do, what do I do next? And I, and, and I thought, I'm, I'm going to get, I'm going to find a coach. And I had a coach uh, and nobody knew about it. It was just my personal coach and they coached me for the, and it, and it was a fantastic, it had a fantastic impact. And I, and I really, really encourage people to look at that. If you are stuck where you are, you feel like you're not at your full potential. I would go find Eddie or somebody like Eddie to, to help you because we all need we all need that safe space and a, and a third party to bounce things off. Who is who is simply invested in us and has no other no other interest in it, right? Has no other hidden agenda. Unfortunately, like your colleagues or even your family members might have. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, so what are, so um, so how do you help people? Because as I said, self reflection is the pathway to to self awareness, right? And and what happens with a self aware leader that you don't see in other people? Self-awareness is a component of emotional intelligence. Mm -hmm. And emotional intelligence is a area that I spend a lot of time in. This idea that for the longest time, all of us were rewarded with our IQ. We know what IQ is, basically how yeah. smart we are, right? But when you're at operating at levels like you're talking about in an organization, at the highest levels, everyone has an IQ, has mm -hmm. a high IQ. They went yes. to the top schools. They have the best pedigree. So what starts to separate people is not the IQ, but their EQ, their emotional intelligence. And so self-awareness is fundamentally a part of that. It goes back to leadership. If we don't know who we are, we can't start to understand other people. Mm -hmm. And if we don't know what it is that affects our level of emotional performance, we don't know how we're coming across to other people. We don't know the impact, be it good, bad, or otherwise, we're having on individuals. So emotional self-awareness is so important for a leader. And this applies whether you're a leader of a business or just a leader of your family. Mm -hmm. Are we no, aware? Yeah, and I think that's it. And I think, unfortunately, as I said, the crazy world we live in today where people are so worked up and... And as somebody put the other day, engaging in almost recreational anger, it's uh, it's the impact that you can have on those around you, the positive impacts that you know would make a big difference if everybody just sort of settled down for a moment and tried to have the greatest impact they have on their on their small circle around them. The world would be a better place. And I think that's uh, you you have a, you have a part about leadership development of others. Um, so talk to me about that because sometimes I think. Uh, people make the mistake of, okay, I'm going to help, I'm going to develop you, but I'm just going to develop you in my image, right? because that's probably the best way for you to go. Because I'm here, and if you want to be here, then probably just follow, do what I did. And that's, and that's not appropriate. No, you're right. For years, that was the model of leadership development. In fact, I was reading something recently, I can't remember what it was, but I worked for GE, mm -hmm. and I spent almost 10 years at GE. And I spent time there during the age of Jack Welch. Yeah. And if you interviewed anybody who worked for GE during the Jack Welch era, many of those executives will tell you that every person to a T patterned themselves after Jack Welch, and you basically want to be the next Jack. 
Yeah. You wanted to walk like Jack, talk like Jack, act like Jack in every way, because that was the, the image of success. Yeah. Yeah. As for people understand that, no, times have changed and so have people. And if you are acting like Jack Welch was, that model doesn't work in 2020. <laughs> right. Sure. So in any way, shape or form with my clients, I always help them to understand what should leadership look like for you. It should be like a custom made suit or custom mm -hmm. made dress. It should only fit you. It shouldn't mm -hmm. fit anyone else because leadership in some ways is personal. And in other ways, it's, it's aspirational. Can someone strive to want to be like you because of the example you're setting while still discovering who the leader is inside of them? Mm -hmm. And so some people might feel like, hey, I'm too short to be a leader or I'm too, uh, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not thin enough or whatever it may be, or I, I have a, a, a speaking impediment. But in each of those things that we feel it would make preclude us from being a leader, there's tons of examples of people who have succeeded with those exact same foibles or frailties. Mm -hmm. And so I work with people to become the best leader they can be, no matter who they are, uh, discovering what it takes to be a leader that is not positional power or a leader that acts like a certain other person, but really taps that leader within. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with you. Cause I think at the end of the day, um, I think it was, uh, what was it? Um, it was Oscar Wilde who said, you know, be yourself because everyone else is taken. Yes. Uh, and, and I think that's a, that's a perfect quote because yes, you can take inspiration from, from you, from other people, you can take bits, but at the end of the day, you have to take those bits and you have to integrate them into yourself and be your version of, of the best leader. Mm hmm Absolutely. All right. Well, listen, Eddie, this has been a, this has been a wonderful conversation uh, and very interesting and I hope inspiring to people. Before we go, I'd just like you to tell people a little bit more about yourself and how they can find out more about you and the services you offer. Sure. Well, John, I've enjoyed talking with you. Thank you for having me. I'm Eddie Turner, the Leadership Accelerator. I work with leaders to accelerate their performance and drive impact through the power of coaching, facilitation, and professional speaking. They can learn more about me at eddieturnerllc.com. Well, fantastic, Eddie. And as I said, I'm a big proponent of coaching. So definitely take a look at, uh, maybe take a look and see how much money you spent on your golf coach or your tennis coach or whatever it is last year, and maybe see if you could divert a little bit of that to your professional life. Absolutely. <laughs> All right, my name is John Golden, the Sales Pub Online Sales Magazine and Pipeliner CRM. I'll see you for another expert interview really soon. Thank you.